Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered and let them that hate him flee from before his face. As smoke vanishes, so let them vanish and, and melt at, as wax before the fire. So let sinners perish at the presence of God and let the righteous re rejoice. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Annie, please introduce our speaker this evening. Our speaker this evening earned his PhD in systematic theology from Ave Maria University. Dr. Jared Stout currently serves as the director of content for Exodus 90 and as an instructor for the lay division of St. John Vianney Seminary. He's the author of several books, including recently, How the Eucharist Can Save Civilization, The Primacy of God, The Virtue of Religion in a Secular Age, and just to prove that academic theologians can have some fun too, he is author of The Beer Option, Brewing a Catholic Culture Yesterday and Today. Dr. Stout blogs at buildingcatholicculture.com and appears regularly in Catholic journals, including Catholic World Report, Crisis Magazine, and Catholic Exchange. He has taught multiple popular courses at the ICC, including the Art of Catechesis and Theology 101 and 102. He and his wife, Anne, have six children, and he is a Benedictine oblate. It is good to have you back, Dr. Stout. Dr. Stout, welcome. Thanks, Father. And you know, you really don't need beer to have fun as a theologian. You get to talk about things like scholasticism. <laughs> what could be more fun than that? Exactly. <laughs> That's so great. it's really great to be back with everyone. And you know, my wife, you know, speaking about the topic, she said, why is it that you always get to talk about all these great things like scholasticism that everyone else would be afraid to even touch with a 10-foot pole? And, you know, really, this is such a relevant topic because scholasticism is all about bringing together faith and reason. And that is so relevant today. We need to look to scholasticism as a model for us for reintegration, reintegrating faith and reason because they have fallen away from one another. So we're going to learn about a lot of great things, unfortunately not beer, and it's not, not on our topic for tonight, maybe another night, uh, but we are going to talk about things like universities. Um, where did they come from? We're going to talk about things like a dunce cap. Yes, where did that come from, right? Who, who wore those dunce caps? Um, and how about science? What does science have to do with scholasticism? So those are some of the little tidbits that we're going to get. But the overarching thrust, once again, is the integration of knowledge. That's what the medieval scholastics were all about. And as Father said, medieval Christendom was really a, a time of glory in terms of Christian culture. Not that everyone was perfect. They were not, right? But in terms of integrating faith into the whole of life and society. And scholasticism is the integration of faith into the fullness of learning. It is the complete baptism of reason. Because the church fathers certainly used reason, but they used it as a tool. They were primarily trying to explain the scriptures to refute heresy, uh, and they were drawing upon philosophy, primarily Platonic philosophy, to assist them in doing that. But theology really was the emphasis. And if you look at our culture today, well, we know the emphasis is primarily on science. And theology is possibly tolerated, but perhaps not even tolerated, and sometimes not even considered to be knowledge at all, because only empirical scientific knowledge is considered to be knowledge by many in the modern world. So in the middle here, we have those 
middle ages, <laughs> which of course is a, is a pejorative term, you know, that, that age that was stuck in between the classical world and, and the modern world, but we would call it the culture of Christendom. And in terms of theology, the medieval scholastics took reason and the possibilities of engaging reason very seriously, we would say, as seriously as they possibly could in terms of explaining the faith. So this is my definition of scholasticism. It is a speculative form of theology that rigorously applies philosophical thinking to understanding the faith. And what do I mean by speculative? Uh, what I mean by that is they were asking questions about the faith, speculation, right? They wanted to know, they wanted to push things farther, to enter into new ground, to ask questions that nobody had asked before, to solve problems that perhaps didn't even seem like they could be solved. That's the speculative aspect of scholasticism. And we can really look at a long history of scholasticism. Some people would start it even as early as the year 500. And some people would take scholasticism up even to 1500 or beyond. Our primary focus tonight is going to be from the years 1050 to 1400. And so really the period from 500 to 1050 is a period of foundation. And we'll hit that just very briefly. But starting in 1050, we have this time of experimentation. What can reason really do in theology? Um, and, you know, when, when you're trying out something, you, you tend to make mistakes. And so from that period, there really is a culmination in which there was a great synthesis in the early 1200s. So about from the year 1200 to 1250 would be a kind of apogee of scholasticism. And then there's a long decline. From the end of the 13th century to about 1400, we're going to be looking at the steps that kind of led to the demise of scholasticism. So the period of decline. Now, there were late scholastics that kept going even after the year 1400. We're not going to look at any of them, um, but they were considered to be a bit decadent, asking questions that nobody even cared about and, and being a bit too insular. There is, however, a period of revival of scholasticism in the 16th and 17th century centered in Spain, particularly. Um, and so I, I'll hint at that. I'll just give you a little bit of information about that if we have time. And then there was a whole nother round of a revival of scholasticism beginning in the late 1800s and going up until the mid 20th century. Uh, so you can really spread out the history of scholasticism from 500 to the 20th century, but we're looking at the core period. Once again, 1050 to 1400 um, is what we're looking at. Now, I love etymology. And so what does scholasticism mean, even just in terms of the word itself? Well, the word skole is Greek for leisure. And already in the ancient world, there, there were some uh, philosophers who called themselves a scholasticus. That is one who was dedicated to leisure, to thinking, to writing, to conversing, these great things that philosophers do. Uh, now, St. Benedict, though, used the term differently. He said that he wanted in founding monasteries to found schools of the Lord's service, that he was taking a philosophical and more academic term and applying it to the religious life, saying that the leisure of philosophy can find its expression most deeply in the monastery. And so that shifted the understanding of scole in a Christian context. And so the monastery became the actual place of what we would call a scola, a Christian school. Charlemagne even mandated that every monastery and cathedral throughout his empire had to have a scola, a school. And the head of that scola was called, the same term as we saw from the ancient world, a scholasticus. That is one who was dedicated to learning. And then with the rise of the universities, which came out 
of a union of teachers from the cathedral and monastery schools. So they kind of unionized together. That's what the word university means, um, a kind of guild uh, for educators. Uh, the students at the universities were called a scholaris. They were scholars. And so the term scholasticism refers most properly to the schoolmen, the study of the schoolmen at the monastery schools and at the universities. And when we think about scholasticism, we're thinking primarily about philosophy and theology. But at the, at the schools and the universities, they would have learned the seven liberal arts, the trivium and the quadrivium. And in that studied philosophy, and then only moved on to theology after completing the seven liberal arts. So there, there was a broad range of study. But when we think of the fruit of the scholastic period, the writings of these figures, we're thinking primarily philosophy, and especially theology, which is our focus tonight. The universities were really trying to organize all knowledge. And so even though the word university, universitas, meant a kind of guild, which united teachers and students together, it did have another context of pursuing a kind of fullness of learning. And even within the seven liberal arts, you had the, the, the trivium, which was grammar, uh, logic, and rhetoric. These were the three ways related to the word. Uh, these were then expanded into the quadrivium, the four ways, uh, which had to do with number, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And that was the basis for natural science, the study of the world itself. And so it is a misunderstanding, even you could say a lie, if you wanted to go to that extreme, to say that the scholastics were not interested in science. It is true, in fact, that science began in the scholastic period in the medieval university. That is a fact, and it grew out of the teaching of the quadrivium. I'll give you some more evidence about that when we get to that period of time. Um, but this search for the fullness of knowledge entailed then integrating the study of word, the study of things in the universe, metaphysics, these questions that go beyond the natural world, and then, of course, the study of God's own revelation, things that could not even be known by reason. How do these things relate together? How does literature, astronomy, metaphysics, and theology all relate? A lot of people today would say they don't relate, right? We have a lot of fragmentation uh, in learning today. But the medievals thought, no, they must relate. And they sought to create a system of learning to explore those connections. It really was trying to see what reason could do, right? What, what, what is the full expanse of learning? What is it capable of? How, how can we create a whole vision of this life and beyond this life? The way that it did it was based upon the logical thinking of the Greeks, especially the logic of Aristotle. So from the very beginning, even all the way back to the year 500, the logic of Aristotle was the basis for rigorous study. Now, there was a kind of crisis that broke out in the 13th century with the introduction of other books written by Aristotle on the soul, his physics, his metaphysics, um, those were not studied in the early scholastic period or in that foundational period. Uh, it was up to the culmination to integrate them. And that really shook people uh, to have a kind of flood of new knowledge that challenged presuppositions. And that was the excitement for the scholastics, this new information, not only from the past, but building upon that to see what the future was capable of discovering. And so the scientific method did come out of the high scholastic period from figures like Albertus Magnus, um, Bishop Robert Grosteste, and Father Roger Bacon. They were the originators of scientific experimentation in a rigorous form. And 
even if you, you can look this up, right? Even Wikipedia will tell you that Bishop Gross Test and Roger Bacon, who are Englishmen, were the first ones to write down the scientific method. And so it came out of this questioning of the scholastics, their desire to know. They wanted to know all things. But the period of decline was a kind of civil war amongst the scholastics. And the good guys actually lost. Right? And so the figures who really were for an expansive view of knowledge and reason were actually marginalized. And that included St. Thomas Aquinas. We call him today the universal doctor. But he was actually kind of kicked out the door of the universities for a while. And that actually led to a breakdown of scholasticism where they were no longer willing to accommodate scientific experimentation. And that is why today people think, oh, well, the medieval un universities were hostile to science because scientists like Francis Bacon, who would come along later on, um, would actually say that the universities of his day were not interested in empirical science. They were only interested in reading the works of Aristotle. And we'll talk about why that split happened, right? That's the period of decline. So the overarching questions faced by the scholastics had to do, all of them, with the relationship of faith and reason. They wanted to ask difficult questions on that topic. What was the role of logic and philosophy for theology? Can faith contradict reason? Right? I think a lot of people today would say, well, of course it does. Right? And there were some people in the Middle Ages who said yes. Right? But the scholastics really wanted to investigate that. Could there be a harmony between the two? Where does natural science fit into the university? How could all knowledge be organized into one system. And these were things like the summa, so that were written to organize knowledge in one whole. So the characteristics of this theology, which is our main focus, right, um, is that scholastic thinking is logically rigorous, right? It's not trying to skirt around issues. And one of the things that I love about scholasticism is it says, okay, Bring all of your most difficult questions. We're going to debate them. Don't hold anything back. Give me all of it. Even things like, does God exist? Can you believe they asked that in the medieval universities? They were all Catholics. They all believed that God exists. And yet they sat around and debated whether or not God exists. And they actually were encouraged to raise objections against God's existence. Isn't that incredible? I mean, you would never think that today. You're like, well, yeah, in the Middle Ages, if you asked any questions, you were thrown into a dungeon and tortured. And it's like, oh, no, actually, it was the exact opposite of that, right? You, you were encouraged to have a debate, at, at least at the universities, right? I mean, if you started going to your local parish and saying God doesn't exist, okay, sure, you might have run into some trouble. But um, the scholastics wanted to ask every difficult question and face it, you know, squarely. They wanted to think systematically, right? And so that is a characteristic of scholastic theology, not to just kind of, you know, think about one little branch of theology or just to focus on, you know, certain questions. They wanted to organize all of these difficult questions into one whole body of thought. They wanted to integrate philosophy into theology. And that really was a difficult point because we're going to talk about some examples of that going badly, right? Integrating philosophy into theology sounds good, except that certain people made philosophy more important than theology. Other people, you know, really resisted that integration. So there was a whole range of reactions to that scholastic attempt. And another thing that they loved was to try to find arguments for what was most fitting. You see this in Aquinas all the time. Aquinas is hesitant to say that God ever had to do anything. Others of the scholastics did not hesitate that. And they were always looking for these kind of necessary arguments. But they at least wanted to, to find what would be most reasonable, most just, most fitting. And they wanted to really explore that. 
to say that God is all truth, all goodness, all justice. And so what does that really mean? How do we understand salvation in light of the fact that God is perfect goodness and perfect truth and, and that he himself is most reasonable and most knowable and most understandable for that reason, even though we do have limits <laughs> to our ability to know God who is most understandable, right? I mean, he is perfectly simple. This is something the scholastics talked about often. You might think, what, simple? Well, yes, because God doesn't have any parts. He just simply is who he is. He's not composed of anything. He doesn't change. He's most simple. And yet we have a hard time grasping that. And so in this attempt, the scholastics also had to face the fact that they would often run into a wall. And they, even though they wanted to seek what was most reasonable, they couldn't always find it. And there was one patristic source that kept reminding them of that, and that was Dionysius the Areopagite. That is a Syriac monk who claimed to be a disciple of St. Paul, converted during his speech in Athens. And Aquinas and, and most of the scholastics read him very deeply. And Dionysius always says that, that God is most reasonable, but he's beyond reason. He's most good, but he's beyond all of our conceptions of what is good. And so Aquinas would say that according to reason, all we can really say is what God is not. We know that he is the fullness of perfection, but we ourselves can't even grasp that. We can, we can only grasp shadows of that. And he's always beyond. Now, if others tried to contradict that and bring God down to the level of reason, right? that is where the scholastics ran into problems. So the rest of this talk is going to be very much focused on individuals. And in our foundational period, the two most significant theologians are Augustine and Boethius. So we'll touch on them briefly. In our period of the preservation, and I'll explain what I mean by that, uh, we have figures like Isidore of Seville and Venerable Bede and St. Bernard who are handing down knowledge. In the period of exploration, and this is where we're really getting into that period of 1050 that we're focusing on primarily, we have Lanfranc, Anselm, and Abelard. That's where it starts getting really interesting. <laughs> and then the period of culmination. So this would be the three individuals who most perfectly express what scholastic theology is. And that's Albert the Great. Thomas Aquinas, and Bonaventure, those three great saints and doctors of the church. And then in the period of decline, we have John Duns Scotus. That is where the Duns cap comes from, <laughs> from his followers in, in the late scholastic period. And during the rise of science, they said, oh, those dunces, right, who follow Duns Scotus and don't know anything about real science, you know? And that's where the ter term Duns cap comes from, is from Duns Scotus. And then William of Ockham. So interestingly enough, um, both of those figures in the period of decline are from the British Isles. Okay, so that's our itinerary for the second half of this talk, is, is looking at those figures, especially in the period of exploration, culmination, and decline. Okay, so just some brief notes about this stage of preservation. Um, this is really continuing the foundation, right? St. Augustine's theology was the foundation for all theology in the scholastic period. The textbook that medieval theologians used was called the Sentences of Peter Lombard. If you wanted to be a theology professor in the Middle Ages, you had to write a dissertation which was a commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences. What does the word sentence mean? Sententia was the opinion of the fathers. 80% of that textbook of these opinions of the church fathers was from St. Augustine. And so that tells you something, right? That Augustine was the primary theological source for the scholastics. 
Now, Boethius, who was also from the foundational period, was the one who set out the goal of using reason as much as possible. Boethius, in his commentary on the Trinity, I'm sorry, his exposition on the Trinity, said, as far as you are able, join reason to faith. The reason why I call that a commentary is that Aquinas wrote a commentary on that great exposition on the Trinity. And so that's where we really see, okay, the, the theological source and the method, methodological source come from those two figures. And that was passed down in this stage of preservation in the cathedral schools and the monastery schools. They copied the works of the church fathers. They copied classical authors. Um, they were very interested in figures like Virgil because Virgil's literature and grammar actually helped them to read the Bible in Latin. They were interested in Cicero's rhetoric that taught them the beauty of speech. And they were interested in Aristotle's logic. Now, they could have had access in this period to the other works of Aristotle, but they actually weren't interested in them. Why? Well, the, the church fathers, including St. Augustine, were primarily Platonists. That is, they were more influenced by the the kind of transcend the transcendent philosophy of Plato that was more focused on the reality of the other world. For Plato, it was the world of the forms, these kind of the perfect idea of things, which are not actually found within the material world. They're found in a transcendent realm. And that resonated with the church fathers. And there was a group of heretics, the Nestorians, who were focused very much on the concreteness of Christ's humanity. And they focused more on the philosophy of Aristotle. And so Aristotle was actually tainted um, in the patristic period. And, and other than his works on logic, he was set aside for many hundreds of years. And the rediscovery of his other works will be like an explosion uh, when we get to the, to the high period of scholasticism. But even within these cathedral and monastery schools, copying the works of the church fathers and the Bible and, and the select group of classical authors, they were attracting students from all over Europe. If we look at the example of one of our main figures, Anselm, he was born in Lombardy in northern Italy. He went to northern France, to Normandy, to study with Lanfranc at the Abbey of Beck. And then he became Archbishop of Canterbury in England. And so it was very international in this period that you had young men who wanted to go learn with these, the, with the scholasticus, those scholars and teachers at some of the great schools. We can look at the Cathedral School of Chartres, which was actually an early center for natural science. Or the most famous examples were was the university, I'm sorry, well, Paris, which grew out of the Cathedral School of Notre Dame, along with the abbeys of St. Germain and St. Victor and others in the area uh, surrounding Paris. And so students would travel all over to study at these particular locations. And so that created the stage then for the foundation of the university. So if we get into the stage of exploration, this is where the logical thinking of the scholastics really picks up speed. Because if we look at the figures that I mentioned in the stage of preservation, St. Isidore of Seville, or if we look at Venerable Bede, they were monks who were interested in the contemplation of God's revelation. And yes, they read classical authors, um, but they did so primarily within the contemplative attitude of the monastery. That's what marks the years between 500 and 1050. What's the difference when we get to the 11th century, the stage of exploration? Is that scholars began to think, is there more that we could do with the logic of Aristotle? And so we have two very different figures who really mark this breakthrough in the rise of scholasticism, Anselm and Abelard, both of whom were monks, very, very different monks. Um, Anselm was an Augustinian who wanted to use kind of rigorous logical thinking 
to contemplate the truths of the faith, to really be able to think about their truth in and of itself. So it's just kind of odd for us, I think, to think about it from this perspective. He said, things that I believe, like the incarnation, I want to contemplate them using reason alone to try to understand them better, to understand their reasonableness. He's not trying to prove the, the, the matters of faith, but he says, once we believe them, we want to use reason to examine them and explain them as deeply as possible. This is where we've kind of making, we're making a turn from the, the monastic theology to what we call scholasticism proper. And Anselm is often called the father of scholasticism for this very purpose. If we look at the handout, this is from one of his most famous works, Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Man. And so let's see what he says about his method. I have been often and most earnestly requested by many, both personally and by letter, that I would hand down in writing the proofs of a certain doctrine of our faith, which I am accustomed to give inquirers. For they say that these proofs gratify them and are considered sufficient. This they ask, not for the sake of attaining to faith by means of reason, which is impossible, right? But that they may be gladdened by understanding and meditating on those things which they believe. And that as far as possible, they may be always ready to convince anyone who demands of them a reason of that hope which is in us, which is a quote of from St. Peter in the New Testament, right? Be, always be ready to give an apologia or a defense of what you believe. Skipping down about six or seven lines, therefore, since many desire to consider this subject, and though it may seem very difficult in the investigation, it is yet plain to all in the solution and attractive for the value and beauty of the reasoning. Right, so this is what he is, is finding valuable, the reasoning itself. Although what ought to be sufficient has been said by the Holy Fathers and their successors, yet I will take pains to disclose to inquirers what God has seen fit to lay open to me, right, through his own reasonable investigation, right? So in this work, he does something very bold. He said, I, I want to contemplate why God became man solely thinking about the fittingness of it from the viewpoint of reason? Why was it even necessary that it had to happen this way from the viewpoint of reason? And just very briefly, this will give you an idea, right, of how he was proceeding. He said, sin creates an infinite debt to God, and God is perfectly just. And so therefore, he would require that this infinite debt be paid. He could simply wave it away, but then he wouldn't be true to himself, which is fully just. But he also doesn't want to see his creation and man go to waste. That would not be fitting to him because he is good and his creation is good. And so simply to allow it to go off and be bad, right, wouldn't be fitting to God either. So there's a dilemma. How can God be just and not allow his creation to go to pot, if you will. <laughs> well, there's one way in which God can fulfill a demand of infinite justice and still be true to the need for man himself to make up for this debt. And the way that he does that is by becoming man, because only God could make up for an infinite debt against his goodness. But only man needed to pay that debt, right? And so God becoming man is seen as the most perfect, the most reasonable, and the most fitting way that God could lead us out of sin. So you can see, like, he's not trying to prove, you know, that the incarnation happened, right? That's a matter of faith but he's trying to use reason to understand what he believes. And that really is his motto, right? It, it, he says this in his work, The Proslogion, 
which, where his famous uh, proof for the existence of God is articulated. But, but he says that his motto is fides quirens intellectum, that is faith seeking understanding, and even more significant, credo ut intellegum, I believe so that I may understand. And we really bring these things together, right? That when we believe, we can then be led to understand. But how do we do that? By faith seeking understanding. Right? How does faith seeking understanding through this kind of rational um, contemplation of what God has revealed to us? Now, if we turn to Abelard, and, and both of them um, are living in the 11th century, right? So this is that, that really the beginning period, although Abelard will live longer into the 12th century than Anselm that Abelard was more of a kind of hotshot, right? <laughs> is that he was a premier student of logic. And he became famous by actually trumping his teachers and showing them up about how smarter he was than them in debate. And he began attracting his own students and even became a teacher at the emerging University of Paris. But he got himself into trouble is that he took a wife secretly and impregnated her, that he was supposed to be her tutor, Eloise, uh, and you've probably heard of her. Um, and her family then, in retaliation, actually castrated Abelard. And so he retired to the monastery. And that's actually where he began his theological career, as a monk at Saint-Denis. So he went from a logician, who was very famous for his argumentation, to then trying to use logic um, to explain the faith. And it is his theological work, which he wrote as a monk at Saint-Denis, which was seen as going too far, of actually falling into rationalism in his explanation of the Trinity. And what does that mean? Well, Anselm was trying to, to draw philosophy up into the contemplation of faith in a very Augustinian and Platonic manner. Abelard was trying to draw theology down into philosophical thinking in a way that could be comprehended by reason and therefore even reduced to reason. Rosaline, who, who was another figure at the time, was more of just an all-out rationalist, right? Whereas Abelard kind of skirted the issue, but St. Bernard, his great enemy, <laughs> actually had him condemned as a heretic. St. Bernard put his finger on the fact that Aristotle's logic, if used too excessively, excessively would turn to heresy. And exhibit A for him was Abelard. Now, Abelard's more enduring contribution can be seen in our second reading uh, in the handout. Um, a work that is called Seek et Known, which simply means yes and no. And this is something that, in my opinion, embodies the scholastic methodology in its early period more than anything else, right? I mean, you could see Cur Deus Homo, which is such an amazing reflection, but this, this work actually represents, I would say, the scholastics getting their fingers dirty, like what they did on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is debate. There was something at the medieval universities called a disputation. And this is what I referred to earlier, right? There would be a disputed question. And the students and professors had actually come together and they would put opinions out there on both sides of a question. And, and they would actually try to give the best arguments in favor of both sides. And by doing that, not just favoring the side that they thought was right, but by looking at both sides, that they would come to a better resolution in the end. Where does this come from? Seek at known, yes at no. And, and you know, Abelard was really a character. <laughs> you can kind of get a sense of that from his biography. Um, what he did is he collected what seemed to be contradictory statements from the church fathers and put them side by side without commentary. And so these are simply some of the questions, right? So this is a very long work. I can't say that I've read every page, but I've read pages of it. 
And what he does is he will ask these questions and then he'll go to the church fathers, primarily Augustine, and he'll get positions on one side and positions on another side that seem to contradict. And he would then tell his students, okay, you find the resolution. You think through these apparent contradictions and see if you can figure out you know, where the truth lies. It was brilliant, actually. But what are some of these questions? These questions themselves give us insight into the kinds of things that scholastics wanted to know. Must human faith be completed by reason or not? Does faith deal only with unseen things or not? Jumping down to, to question number 30, can even sins please God or not? And, and pay, remember that one, because we're going to come back to that in the period of decline. Is God the cause and initiator of evil or not? Can God do anything and everything or not? You know, what's the great question that Thomas Aquinas asked? Can God create a stone so heavy that he couldn't lift it? You know, these, these are the kinds of things. They did not talk about how many angels could dance on, on the, the, the head of a needle. Okay, that's not something they actually debated. But could God create a rock that was so heavy he couldn't lift it? Yeah, they did debate that. Does God have free will? Does God do whatever he wants? Right? We just said he's perfect goodness, perfect truth, perfect justice. So does that mean he, just, he can do whatever he wants or not? Does anything happen contrary to God's will or not? These are the kinds of things that were debated. And so that, that character, Abelard, just kind of put that out there and let it sit. In Peter Lombard's sentences, which I referred to earlier, which was the key textbook of, of this time period, tried to assemble the opinions of the fathers, primarily Augustine, in a way that kind of pointed students more towards the truth of St. Augustine's teaching. But Thomas Aquinas would come along and actually try to create an even more perfect synthesis um, of these differing uh, opinions. And so if, if you were to open up St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, what would you see? The very first thing for every single article are objections, right? And so he can take these contrary positions and, and lay them out there and then give um, a said contra, something that seems to contradict those objections. And there were a bunch of said contras in the disputations, but, but he usually just lists one, sometimes maybe two. And then he gives his own opinion, and then he responds to the objections. All right, so we can see even Aquinas's way of writing is shaped by the back and forth of these objections and questions. All right, is it this side or is it that side? And Aquinas will often say, well, the objection may be wrong in this way, but we can also see how it does point us to the truth as well in this regard, right? And I love how Aquinas so often answers yes and no to a question. What about this? Well, yes, from this regard, but no, not, not in that sense, right? Is that he's able to make these distinctions and scholastics are always making distinctions. Insofar as this is true, then that's true. But insofar as this position errs in, in this regard, well, then this cannot be true following from that, right? And you just see this kind of reasoning. People love St. Thomas Aquinas because he is very understandable. Is that if, if you opened up the Summa, just, just pick a, a question and underneath that an article, and just give it a try. Well, I've done that with many people. And what they say is, I can't believe how he's able to take such a difficult question and just explain it so succinctly in a way that is so logical. It's not obtuse. Uh, it, it's just so clear. Um, there, there's a, a student of mine who's, who um, is actually the director of a biblical school who fell in love with St. Thomas, uh, reading him in class. Even somebody like John Sr., if you ever heard of him, he converted to the Catholic faith because he said reading St. Thomas Aquinas was pure common sense. That's what he said. <laughs> now, if you compare that to, to John Duns Scotus, I've spent a lot of time trying to read Scotus, and it's very, very difficult to read Scotus. Because unlike Aquinas, who's very succinct, 
SCOTUS is not succinct. And Aquinas will make distinctions that logically flow from one another, but SCOTUS will go this way, and then it'll go this way, and then it'll go back that way, and then it'll come this way. He's called the subtle doctor for a reason. And I'm like, I don't think I know what he actually believes on this topic. I, 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 you know, what I mean? it's hard to, to follow SCOTUS, right? But Aquinas isn't like that. So this, this kind of the subtlety of scholastic thinking and the distinctions can be done well, or, or it could be, be done in ways that are more difficult. Okay, so let's turn to this period of, of culmination. And what are our three figures here? Albert, Aquinas, and Bonaventure. This is the time of the creation of the universities, right? So they began in that previous period, right? Even during Abelard's time. But this is really where they're in their, in their, their full flourishing. And we have these brand new religious orders, the Dominicans and the Franciscans who show up and are teaching at the universities and having great influence. Albert and Aquinas are Dominicans and Bonaventure is a Franciscan. And they develop different ways of thinking about scholastic theology. The Dominicans will really just soak up these new reintroduced works of Aristotle. They want to know all about natural science and they're going to focus on the body and, and, and the body's relation to the soul, the body's role in human learning, very tangible, very sensible. And not that they're not going to think about metaphysical questions, but they want those questions to start from the ground up. All knowledge begins in the senses, according to Aristotle. And that's where the Dominican approach will begin. The Franciscans remained more Platonic and more Augustinian. And that is they, they want to jump into the contemplation of realities through faith. They're more Platonic in the sense that Plato says you arrive at truth by contemplating transcendent forms. It's not that they'll deny the importance of the senses, but they're not necessarily going to begin there. And so Aquinas starts talking about natural knowledge of God before he talks about revealed knowledge of God. That's a Dominican thing to do. Bonaventure will start immediately talking about the Trinity. Uh, the Dominicans will talk a lot about body and sense knowledge, but the Franciscans will immediately jump into the soul, into the, the will and its love for God. And so the Dominicans became marked more by the contemplation of the intellect, and the Franciscans became more marked by the will's role in contemplation. That, that the will is what directs us in the love of God, to, to cling to him and to learn from him through that love. And so two very different schools. Albert was actually the, the first medieval thinker to write scientific works based on experimentation. He wrote works on botany and zoology. And he actually contradicted Aristotle. He, he gives an example like, Aristotle thought that eels lived on mud. And he said, but I've watched eels. I know what they eat. I know how they live. I've seen them move in the water. Albert was a bishop and a professor at the university. And yet he spent time watching eels. <laughs> okay, this is the greatness of scholasticism. Matt. This is how they wanted to, to get at knowledge. And so Albert said, for instance, there can be no philosophy about concrete things. What does he mean by that? This is very important for the rise of science. Philosophy is the contemplation of the nature of things. And so he said that when we talk about concrete material things, what we need there is observation, not philosophical thinking. You, you have to build to philosophical thinking. You can't take philosophical thinking and impose that upon concrete things. Late scholasticism will actually do that. And that's why people saw late scholasticism as contrary to science. He says in such matters of the study of concrete things, he says, um, this is a knowledge of reality through experience. So Albert's great contribution was integrating the works of Aristotle on physics, on the soul, the de anima, and the metaphysics, really drawing them into the university and rehabilitating Aristotle, because actually the study of Aristotle's works had actually had been banned at the university for a while. 
because they were worried about Aristotle's position on things like, was there a beginning of the world? Is the soul immortal? Um, how do human beings know things? Do, do we come to a knowledge on our own? Or is it something that has to be moved directly by God? These are the kinds of questions that troubled people initially. And so Albert actually became a champion of Aristotle in rehabilitating him in the eyes of the church. It's a huge contribution. And he taught Aristotle to his pupil, St. Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas actually wrote commentaries on the works of Aristotle. So, so did Albert, actually. So both of them engaged in the study of philosophy for its own sake. They said, we just want to know what Aristotle thought and whether he's right or wrong. Because we want to know the truth about reality. And Aristotle is opening up a new horizon to us. And we don't have to agree with him on everything. But we want to know where he's right and where he's wrong. And we want to integrate that with theology. So what is Aquinas known for? Aquinas creates the most perfect synthesis of faith and reason in the entire history of the church. That is, he most fully is able to grasp the philosophy of Aristotle, but his thinking is actually still Platonic in some very significant ways. And so he's able to, to, to grasp what is really at stake in the study of philosophy to draw that into theology and to use it in a balanced way that does not overshadow theology. I, sometimes I laugh to myself, I'm reading Christological questions in the Summa, and there's Aristotle. He says, well, Aristotle says this in the, in the physics, and that principle can help us to think about the incarnation in this way. And I'm like, really? But, but it, it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel like it's imposing anything upon the doctrine itself. And, and if we look at our handout here from St. Thomas Aquinas, um, this is from the Summa Contra Gentiles, and this is almost like his Cur Deus Homo. Uh, Aquinas was writing this for Dominicans who were missionaries to pagan lands, and by that he mostly meant Muslim lands, actually, so that they could talk about the faith with rational arguments. And so he says, and this is in the bottom of the second page of the handout, he says, now while we are investigating some given truth, we shall also know what errors are set aside by it. And we shall likewise show how the truth that we come to know by demonstration is in accord with the Christian faith. That's what he was really interested in. To be able to understand philosophy in the fullness and know where it goes wrong, but then to be able to draw it into the contemplation of the faith. And he did it. Now, at the time, some of his peers thought he went too far. For instance, he had debates with people like Sujet de Bourbon, who was simply willing to accept everything that Aristotle said. If Aristotle thought that the world was eternal, then he was going to defend that from a philosophical position. Now, I know by faith that the world was created by God, but Aristotle says the world is eternal. So I'll just you know, by faith, you know, I'll believe this, but by philosophical reasoning, I'll believe that. Aquinas wasn't satisfied with that. No, they must be drawn together. They cannot contradict one another. Now, Aristotle can be wrong about something, but I'm going to show you how he went wrong, even just on a philosophical level, uh, to, to harmonize them. But on the other hand, there were people who thought that Aquinas was making too many concessions. So John Peckham was a English Franciscan at the University of Paris who debated Aquinas on the other side. And he said that revelation had no need of philosophy, that it was sufficient in itself. And the Franciscans actually said things about Aquinas um, like he was pretty much a pagan. William of Ockham said that, kind of just dismissing Aquinas. Yeah, Aquinas, pretty much a pagan, because he was so focused on Aristotle and trying to bring him into theology. And so Aquinas was actually condemned by the Bishop of Paris in 1277. That was two years after Aquinas died. And John Peckham went back to England and became Archbishop of Canterbury, and he also condemned Aquinas. 
on some of these points. They thought he gave too much ground on, on Aristotle. Now, don't worry, Aquinas has been rehabilitated. He's the only theologian right now whose philosophical and theological teaching is mandated by the Code of Canon Law and also by the Second Vatican Council. Right? No other theologian, not even St. Augustine, who's quoted more in the Catechism than Aquinas, is mandated to be taught. Right? Aquinas is the theologian of the church, the universal doctor. He got that balance right. Now, if we look at his friend, he did not agree with you know, Bonaventure on everything, but they were friends. They were friendly to one another and were able to cooperate in defending the Franciscans and Dominicans at the university from attacks that were made against them. But Bonaventure, even though he drew on Aristotle in particular points, he did not attempt a great synthesis of Aristotle and Augustinian thought. Bonaventure remained much more rooted in the Augustinian tradition. And he has a much you know, different focus on the contemplation of love being primary rather than the contemplation of knowledge. And I personally appreciate the distinctions between them. Uh, I, I, I love to kind of hold them together. Even where I studied theology at Ave Maria, we had a large painting in our library of the two of them kind of like embracing one another. I'm just like, yes, right? You know, um, is that the truths of theology always do transcend our ability to grasp them perfectly. Uh, and I think we can look at the distinct approach of Bonaventure and Aquinas and appreciate it from different perspectives, even though myself, I would be more rooted in the Thomistic tradition, but I've learned a lot from Bonaventure as well. Now, that's an, an important point. Bonaventure is also a doctor of the church. And so the church is saying that we should read him alongside of Aquinas. Now, what about the Franciscans that followed Bonaventure? They did not get the balance of faith and reason right in the same way. John Duns Scotus and William of Ockham were two British scholastics who took the Franciscan tradition of focusing on lo the love of the will over the contemplation of the intellect and took that to an extreme. Um, Scotus completely recoiled against the necessary arguments of the scholastics. What he wanted to do, and, and this is in the late 1200s, right, pushing into the very early 1300s, Scotus wanted to say, we cannot rationally say that God has to do anything. We can't even say that anything is fitting for God on a rational basis. Cur Deus Homo, psh, out the window. The Summa Theologia, out the window. I like to joke that Scotus disagreed with Aquinas on everything, and that means he got one thing right, the Immaculate Conception, right? Anyway, that's my joke as a Thomist, but um, Scotus is blessed Scotus, so I don't want to say he was a bad guy, uh, but I think his, his teaching was very damaging to scholasticism because the, the speculative element of scholasticism was diminished, and there was an emphasis more upon... God's freedom, as Scotus would even say, his radical spontaneity to do whatever he chooses to do in freedom. And human beings have this kind of radical spontaneity as well, that freedom is just kind of an absolute freedom to do what we want. Now, that will be radicalized even more by Occam, right? So Scotus will emphasize God's freedom, and by looking at the human being being characterized by freedom— um, and, and kind of moving then away from the kind of arguments that Aquinas and Anselm would make about the fittingness and the knowability of faith. But Occam will come and even be so much more radical than that. Occam didn't really care much for Scotus, but he did take Scotus's principles and take them even farther. And Occam was actually a kind of renegade Franciscan friar. He ran off after he was condemned as a heretic by the Pope and went to the court of the Holy Roman Emperor and just wrote anti-papal tracts after that. But his thinking was still hugely influential. Um, he said that God has unlimited freedom in the exercise of his power to the point that God is even arbitrary. And I asked you to, to remember one of those sentences um, from Abelard, right? Can, can God simply do whatever he wants? Thomas Aquinas would say, 
that God is not bound by anything outside of himself, but he is true to himself, right? God would not do anything to contradict his own goodness, to contradict his own truth, because, well, then he wouldn't be God, right? Occam, no. Freedom is radical and absolute. And so what does he say? This is the, on the very bottom of the last page of our handout. Hatred, theft, adultery, and the like may involve evil according to the common law, insofar as they are done by someone who is obligated by a divine command to perform the opposite act. As far as everything absolute in these actions is concerned, however, God can perform them without involving any evil. That is, God could do evil things, but they wouldn't be evil because he's doing them. And they can even be performed meritoriously by someone on earth if they should fall under a divine command, just as now the opposite of these, in fact, fall under a divine command. So for Occam, faith is not reasonable. He is what we call a, a, fide, a fideist. A fideist is somebody who says, just believe blindly. Don't try to understand. You can't understand. God simply imposes his will on us, and it's our job to obey blindly. If God says to do this, then it's good. If he says to do the opposite of this, it's good. If God told you to do the opposite of the Ten Commandments, they would all be good. If he told you to be an idolater, that would be good. Right? So quickly we fell far from the thinking of St. Thomas Aquinas. Right? So scholasticism fell to pieces. And it actually set up the Reformation. Martin Luther was trained in what we would call the voluntarist strain of scholasticism that followed from Scotus and Occam. And so Martin Luther was not interested whatsoever in bringing faith and reason together. He thought that reason was the whore of Babylon. And then when we get to the rise of modern science, well, obviously, they were not interested in bringing faith and reason together. So the split of faith and reason in late scholasticism stuck in the modern world. And even though there were revivals in the Baroque period, uh, when you think of like Francisco de Victoria, who used Thomistic thinking to refute slavery in the new world, right? That was a great expression of a revival of scholastic thinking. St. Robert Bellarmine responding to the Reformation. Or much later, in the late 1800s, Pope Leo XIII said that St. Thomas Aquinas's philosophy and theology should be the basis of seminary teaching, and that his synthesis should be the foundation of our own response to the breaking apart of faith and reason in the modern world. It was the foundation for Catholic social teaching. So Leo thought that, that Aquinas's great achievement was enduring and re really re relevant for us today, and I think it is. Right, so if we were to take anything away from this talk, it should be that we as Catholics should not be afraid of the truth. Aquinas said that truth is truth no matter the source, and all truth is from the Holy Spirit. And so we need a great scholastic synthesis. We need to ask all the hardest questions about the relationship of faith and science, all the hardest questions about morality, and we need to draw all of the knowledge that we have access to into a great synthesis. We need a revival of scholasticism today. Thank you so much, Dr. Stout. I think everybody here agrees with you. <laughs> if they I didn't think, before, I hope they do now. Yeah, you were very convincing. I, would, I was just thinking we were talking ahead of the lecture. This is a synthesis of what, three, three or four lectures that you gave in Theology 102 that you just right. compressed into about an hour or so? So um, if you did not take Theology 102, it is now available as a self-paced course at the Institute of Catholic Culture. So you can go uh, check out those lectures if you want even more. But of course, we're moving into Q&A, so we will get even more right now, just not quite that much. So Theology 102, you can find it under the courses at the website. Dr. Stout, are you ready for some questions? I am ready. Okay, so could you just uh, talk a little bit more about how the decline of scholasticism 
could lead to the Protestant revolt, like you were just uh, mentioning mm -hmm. right at the end there. Mm -hmm. Because we have this, this breakdown in the relationship of, of faith and reason. And one of the things that we see in voluntarism is that we just need to blindly submit to God. Luther was trained in the voluntarist and nominalist tradition. He studied the scholastic theology of Gabriel Beale. And so Luther himself was a voluntarist. And he even reduces faith to voluntarism. That is simply submit to God in a kind of blind obedience, and then you will be saved. Don't try to understand him. Reason cannot even know that God exists naturally because reason is completely corrupted. So Luther was part of the more radical Augustinian tradition that rejected the importance of philosophy and reason, um, and that he, even when he was in his early Catholic period, and he was very scrupulous, he was afraid of God, because God for him was a kind of arbitrary power, um, and he realized that he couldn't obey God perfectly, and so he feared damnation. And so his solution to that was simply to submit in his will to God, um, and then God would simply say that he was forgiven in a kind of judicial act. So he was uh, a, a fideist like William of Ockham, that we should not try to understand uh, faith from a kind of philosophical perspective. So it really has to do with the split between faith and reason. And then we see the, the way that that then erodes our ability then to contemplate the, the truth of the faith. How would a voluntarist explain the problem of evil? Yeah, I mean, Luther in particular thought that we were completely corrupt, right? So that just like salvation is a movement of the will and obedience to God, right, in faith, that the will itself is not able to do anything good um, on its own. So what do I see what I see happening already in Occam, right? Is a kind of separating of like our normal life, which is then just kind of secular. And Luther would even say just kind of fallen. Uh, and then you have faith, which is kind of separated out from that, um, which once again, the, the realm of reason is just the earth. The the realm of faith is is simply like I said, apart from that and supernatural. So everything in the world actually would be corrupt and evil from, from that perspective. So voluntarism and its focus on the will, you could just say generally speaking, um, would view evil as disobedience to God. Luther viewed everything apart from faith being disobedience to God. Because Aquinas would say, that sin is something that turns away from goodness, but a voluntarist sees goodness as obedience, right? And evil as disobedience. It's not that Aquinas doesn't agree with that, but he just has a deeper perspective for understanding what is good, something that actually promotes life and being and truth. Um, and then what is evil, which Augustine said is kind of a privation uh, of the good. Speaking of Augustine, Kelly asks, I've heard it stated that St. Augustine did not have many or very good translations of the Eastern Church Fathers. Mm -hmm. Do you agree or do you feel that St. That Augustine and the subsequent scholasticism was in some way limited by this? Yes, there, there is a limit there. Augustine shows that he was aware of the Cappadocians and St. Athanasius. So it's not that he read no Eastern theology. His Greek is better than he lets on because he's like, oh, I'm terrible in Greek. Well, yeah, compared to maybe Greek scholars, but he, he shows that he, he understands Greek vocabulary because he, he was taught Greek from childhood. Now, something that really benefited Aquinas is that there was a, a new kind of flurry of translation of the Greek fathers um, at the same time that Aristotle was being translated from Arabic to Latin. Now, thankfully, then Aristotle was also translated from Greek into Latin, and they, they got rid of those bad translations from the Arabic. But Aquinas had 
more access to the Greek fathers than previous scholastic theologians. And I think that that adds greater depth. And if you really start looking in the Summa, you'll see uh, the Greek fathers and their influence popping up all over the place in the early ecumenical councils as well, which of course were influenced by the Greek fathers. John asks, uh, you mentioned that the church fathers drew heavily on, on Plato. How big a role did Stoicism play in shaping the thoughts of the church fathers and subsequently the scholastics? Not much. I, I think what they found in the Stoics is that they generally agreed with their moral philosophy, but, but found it lacking in that it, it wasn't ultimately about loving God, but, but they found common ground with the control of the passions. You see Aquinas even talking about the Stoics and the Summa from that perspective, saying, okay, yeah, they, they have a kind of semblance of virtue, but, it, but it's not ordered towards the good positively enough. The deepest connection between Stoicism and the theology of the fathers that I have found is that the Stoics viewed the universe as an expression of the logos of ratio, like in, in Cicero's thought, for instance, he's influenced by the Stoics on that point. And so I see the, the Latin church fathers in particular really picking up on that point from Cicero, which he took from the Stoics. Can you explain how uh, Thomistic theology and philosophy became so foundational for how the church understands and explains her doctrines, particularly that he was, because he was controversial in his own time? I mean, how did he get rehabilitated and, and just soar to the heights of, of, of the church um, in what seems like so short a time? Yeah, so the, the Dominicans never abandoned him, thanks be to God. Certain Dominicans did, like Durandus, but nonetheless, so the Dominicans preserved his thought, and, and they really gained influence in Salamanca and Spain, and so some Carmelites started studying Aquinas there, but then the Jesuits adopted him as their theologian, and that served them well for a time. Um, next, and we see that the Council of Trent really drew from Aquinas' thought. At the Council of Trent, they even put the Summa alongside the Bible on the altar uh, of the church in Trent. Now, Aquinas fell out of favor again in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it really was, there, there was a movement of a revival, but then it was Leo the Thirteenth. Um, who discerned the fact that there needed to be a resurgence of scholasticism. And he does mention Bonaventure, um, but he heavily emphasizes Aquinas and even mandates the teaching of, of Aquinas. And all of the popes following Leo XIII up to the Second Vatican Council all speak of the absolute necessity of teaching Aquinas to the point that Pius X even issued a kind of list of metaphysical principles from the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas and condemned anyone who disagreed with them in the church. So Aquinas became mandated very heavily for a certain period of time from the 1880s until the 1960s. And he's still, like I said, he's still on the books in canon law and even referenced by the Second Vatican Council, but he also became obscured after Vatican II. Um, and I think there's, there are many good Thomists uh, who are carrying the torch right now, and I, I would view myself as having a very small role in that movement, but, but we're, we're keeping it going. That's awesome. Bradley asks, was late scholasticism, could you consider that the genesis of existentialism? Well, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of ground in between. There are works, actually many works, that look at the influence of nominalism and voluntarism. Scotus was not a full-blown nominalist or voluntarist, but you see the seeds of it already in his thought. Um, but, but Occam was a full-blown voluntarist for sure. And insofar as they're putting more emphasis on the individual and on the importance of choice, you can see that there's a whole trajectory, right? And, and some people have called Luther, to go back to him, the first modern man. Why? Because he's making individual faith 
to be the center of Christianity, the fact that that would trump the whole authority of the church, the whole tradition of the church, my own personal faith. He says that every man is his own priest, bishop, and pope. And the Bible even say, well, the sola scriptura, right? But the Bible is interpreted by the individual. And so we see that the Enlightenment actually takes a lot of cues from the Reformation. Oh, faith and reason are split. The individual is at the center, right? And, and the, the Enlightenment early on focuses more on reason. But over time, there is more uh, of a move over towards the will. So can you see foundations for that looking farther back in time? Yes, absolutely. No nominalists and voluntarists are almost even like a boogeyman for a lot of Catholic intellectuals. Like it all goes back to that. Like every problem we're facing in the world, we're going to trace back to, you know, 14th and 15th century, you know, nominalism, voluntarism. And there's some truth to that, right? There's some truth. But I think, you know, we, ha we have to look at, you know, a broader historical perspective as well. I like that. I trace it all back to nominalism. Totally. <laughs> like every, every single problem in the world can be traced back to 1517. You don't agree with that? I would say Eden. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's you know, fair, because Dr. nominalism. <laughs> well, I don't know. What, what does God really mean by that? You Will you die? Won't you die? What's death? I don't know what that word means. You know, does it mean anything? And, you know, and, and look at that. That looks good. I, maybe I should choose that, right? So nominalism and voluntarism to go all the way back to Eden. So yeah, it is all there, right? Nice, nice. <laughs> well, actually, that gives us an opportunity. Uh, can you just put in a little plug for your, your book on the Eucharist, speaking of Adam and Eve? Yes. So we are in a Eucharistic revival right now. And my most recent book is How the Eucharist Can Save Civilization. So th the premise is that we need to live the Eucharist. Is really the center of our whole life. And that's how we overcome secularism. And you could even say the split of faith and reason can, can be drawn out of that as well. But yes, I, I do have a section on the fall, right? So food and, and, and drinking, right? And in creation and how that's corrupted in the fall, right? That the fall is through eating, right? And so our salvation then is through eating as well, that the Lord feeds us with his own flesh. I've been going through the book and can highly, highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Scott, would you mind closing us in prayer? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the gift of making us in your image and likeness, for calling us to know the truth and for loving your goodness. Please draw us into a deeper communion with you. Please help us to integrate our faith with all of our life with our learning, our relationships. Please help us to give our lives back to you for your glory and our good. And we give you all glory and honor as we say, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.